Hello, I'm Tom Moore from the Bartizzo Lab and in this particular video we're going to talk about the not so sweet science. By that I mean the fouls and the techniques which you find in modern boxing applied to boxing for street self-defense. So I'm going to take you through some of the most common fouls, how you can do them effectively should you need to. So the not so sweet science. Number one begins with rabbit punches. Now when you want to kill a rabbit you'll hold it up by its legs and you'll smack it between the neck and its skull kills the rabbit. Rabbit punch, nice deadly blow. On a Schumann, there are two really good ways to land a rabbit punch, but bear in mind that both of them can have potentially deadly consequences, if not deadly, hugely, hugely damaging. Now, if you want to pull off a rabbit punch, my two favourite ways to do it. The first one is reaching in an uppercut style fashion. So, if you imagine Bob's arms are here, I'm coming under his arm and I'm going to strike with this big knuckle here, those two big knuckles on the base of his neck, where, he's, where his neck essentially meets his skull, here. So we're moving, done a side step, whoosh, straight up the back here. So rabbit punch number one is an uppercut style one, which typically comes from an underhook. If you imagine you've got an underhook in wrestling, it's like that, but with a strike to the back of the neck. So we're moving, typically you have to get in quite close, and then we burst in with this underhook style punch, Rabbit punch to the back of the head. From here, moving, deep step, get the head nice and close, straight there. It whips straight up, like so. Or an alternative way is to do it as a long looping hook over the arms. So you've got the underhook method. The overhook method is essentially where you do a long hook which turns at the end. So typically I find this works best with a passing step. Okay, or a shuffle step. Let's say I'm punching with my right hand and my right leg is back. I step forward with my right leg, throw my right hand around here. And in this instance, the hand is sitting in a horizontal slash slightly 45 position, big knuckles again into the base of the neck. So we're moving, we're moving. <coughs> Take a dig, big deep step here and we smash. I like to provide this kind of sandwiching method here, whereas as I get close, I stop his body moving forward and I slam the rabbit punch in like so. So we're moving, we're moving, like so. Long looping hook, get it past his head, strike with the knuckles. If you fluff the timing, no bother because you'll still get that forearm to the neck or the side of the jaw. So whether you get the full rabbit punch or whether you get the forearm blow, doesn't really matter, it's going to really hurt. Moving on to number two, nice and simple, kidney hammers. So with a kidney hammer, typically we're in, again, we get ourselves into a boxing underhook clinch position here, elbows in nice and tight to trap the opponent. And again, we base ourselves and we've got decent head position. We're driving it under the jaw. Then what we do is essentially do a rotating movement where we drive the hammers into the kidneys. Typically, these work best in multiples, so two and three. You can over-exaggerate them if you want. I find that you don't need much force to cause trauma to the kidney. So, kind of a small amount of force you can generate with this turning motion is more than enough to cause a lot of pain. As soon as you've got the pain, then you can push off and do other things as per your will. But in the first instance, you're getting nice and close. You then keep your elbows in tight, so you squeeze them around the waist. And remember, you're still in a grappling range, so you still need to be moving, repositioning, watching where your feet are, watch that your body weight's low. But these kidney hammers are a great piece of dirty boxing. Next, we're gonna move into sneaky elbows. Sneaky elbows, as the name implies, are sneaky. So, We've got a couple, the elbow off the hook. So the hook comes in and the elbow comes in. Now sometimes you can get a hook and an elbow. Sometimes you draw the hook short. So you fake the hook and you fire the elbow or you aim to hit with both the hook and the elbow. So you can have boom or you can have ba-boom. So boom, so you draw the hook in at the last minute, you bring it close to your chest, or you provide the hook, 
and then the elbow in one seamless movement, like so. I find that you get less power off the baboon version, but again, something to play with. You've also got the sneaky elbows off the uppercuts. So if we're moving, we uppercut here, and we drive the elbow in. Typically, that stops the upward motion. So instead of being an upward elbow, it tends to be an uppercut and then almost a spear. If that makes sense. So we move in here, boom, boom. Like so. So you've got hook to elbow or fake hook to elbow. You've got uppercut to elbow. And traditionally, that's a spear, which means that you punch it in as opposed to punch it up. You can punch it up, but typically if the uppercut lands, you're going to have to spear that in. Okay? What we've then got is we've got the notion of lacing and palming. So in a traditional boxing glove, you've got this lace up section here. It's all ribbed for her pleasure. It's all ribbed up here. It's a rough, uneven surface, which means that in an old school boxing glove, which I'll put on in a moment, in an old school boxing glove, I can fake a punch at the last minute. I can drive these rougher laces up to where cuts are likely to form above the eyes. So again, I can cause cuts, I can cause damage, and I can just treat it like a kinetic palm strike. Okay, so you've got that motion. You can do something which I call a Pez dispenser, where with that lacing, with that palming, you aim for the top of the forehead to push the head back, and then you crack in with something else. So Pez smash. Nice and simple, but even without that motion, palming is really important. And you can palm at distance, so from far away, or you can palm at close range, like a fair burn chin jab. So you can palm at range, or you can get in nice and close, as if you're in uppercut range, and then just slam it straight in, forearm onto his chest, pushing his head up and back. So you can mush his face in, or you can mush his face up and back. That's called lacing and palming, very, very common in old school boxing gloves. By that same token, again, in old school boxing gloves, you've got framing. In fact, I'll just put these on, make it easier. You've got framing. Now, forearm framing is essentially where you stop the opponent closing distance by providing a 90 degree angle here. You'll see George Foreman is a master of this, he's moving, He'll take a couple of shots on a cross guard, like so, and then he'll push you off. He's got you with the frame. Good thing about the frame is essentially it's a forearm strike. Into the throat, under the nose, anywhere in the maxiofacial region, it's going to hurt, it's going to cause trauma, it's going to knock people off balance. So if you want to practice framing, I typically like it off a, for a foreman cross guard. So moving in, we've got one for the body and one for the face. Importantly, it's not just my arms doing the work. My body goes in. Straight here. I've got that guy. Sometimes the opponent's rushing me, but still, I need to push back on that. So that forearm framing stops the opponent in their tracks, stops them attacking me at their leisure. Next piece of not so sweet science is thumbing use of the thumb. Now again, in an old school boxing glove, you can do the fronds. You've got thumbs, they're not attached to the glove. So you can strike out with mechanically what is a jab, but you can have this thumb out here and you can dig that in. And moving, moving, you've got that kind of penetration. using your thumb, so you've got long distance thumbing. You've also got it where you're in the clinch, and typically that's where it's a bit more subtle. So the head's in, say, a chancery position, and as you transition from one chancery to the other, the thumb might just wipe the eye. So as we're here, and we're hitting, as I transition to maybe a cross collar grip, I get the thumb into the eye and continue my belaboring. So I've landed on a single chancery, <coughs> As I transition, 
I do my thumbing, so I will wipe the thumb across up, and hit with something else. So thumbing long distance, short distance typically with a chancery hold. Then you've got essentially the push off. Now, pushing is actually illegal in, in modern boxing. You're not really allowed to be pushing people off, but it actually has great effect. A good solid shove really knocks you off balance, knocks you mentally off balance. It's not expected in a fight, really. People expect it as part of the pre-fight warm-up. People don't expect it mid-fight. But actually being able to push and punch is a key street skill. So a couple of the best ways to push and punch. First one is to cross push. So my left hand is gonna push on his right shoulder and I want him to turn. I want him to turn somewhat so I can catch him cold. So as you can imagine, the game is for me to work around the man, to get to a point where I can hit him and he can't hit me. So if I push on that shoulder, if I push diagonally across, I turn Bob a little bit, and then I can crack him with something and I can easily get around him. I've slimmed his profile from chest to chest to side on. So the cross push, cross push is really important. I get well versed in both sides. If I push with my right hand, I set him up for the left hook. If I push him with my left hand, I set him up for the right cross. So being able to push and punch is actually very, very useful and can sometimes be more conducive to your self-defense than two punches. Sometimes the push to a punch, the push to the punch moves them in a way which is better, which allows my second punch to be more powerful, more accurate, or delivered from a safer place. Then we've got the shoulder pop. The shoulder pop typically, once we're in close to the opponent, we drive our shoulder in. So there's two, two ways to do the shoulder pop. First one, we're here, and it's driving the shoulder so that I'm sideways on. And that frees up this arm to land something at power. If I'm this close, I can't push, can't hit him at power. So I drive that shoulder in and I turn myself bladed just for a second, just for a second. I don't want to stay bladed because it's easy to be taken over. I just want to move just for a second and then blast in that hook. So here, just gives me that room to throw in the hook. Nice and simple, okay. Sometimes if you're a smaller opponent and you're a bit more square on, the shoulder bars that you might want to try is to bend your knees and do it forwards. So I put my body weight into him. In this instance, I'm using it as a true strike, causing damage into his sternum, or if I'm the height's right, up into his jaw, and you see that in MMA quite a lot nowadays. But if you're a smaller, stockier opponent, drop your body weight and drive forward with that shoulder. But bear in mind that as soon as you've done that, you'll want to turn the angle into something else. You don't just want to stay there. As soon as the percussion has happened, move off. As a taller fighter myself, I prefer being here. I prefer that close up bladed shoulder bump as opposed to the shoulder charge. But both deliver with force, kinetic energy, cause damage, cause off balancing, allowing you to throw something else. Getting the nut in. Now I've got entire videos about headbutting people, but just to press it. Headbutting people is like sneezing. You've got all the muscles and you know how to do it. You know how to explode at speed and ferocity with the nut down and the chin down. So two different types of headbutt as we end up in this mall. One thing I was advised, if you're gonna headbutt, if you can headbutt them, they can headbutt you. So I like to, if I'm throwing headbutts, have my hands in the head space, because then if I need to stop his headbutt on me, I've got something to stop it. Because we're in 50-50 here, if I'm this close, he can nut me and I can nut him. So I wanna make sure I've got some hands in the game up close if we're in this vertical grapple. First one is a standard forward headbutt. You explode with your neck and your back muscles, chin down, using the hard top of your forehead, typically against the jaw or the nose. I prefer the jaw, but again, it depends on height difference, but smash it straight down and be ready 
to fill it again. Often with headbutts, they work best in twos as opposed to one. Most people will fluff the first headbutt because of fear, because of, you can't really judge your distance or your targeting. Sometimes you just cock it up and hit them in the, in the chin, or even not in the chin, on the cheek. It's not gonna cause much damage. So if you throw it in twos, odds are at least one will be effective. So my rule for headbutt, as soon as you get close, get your hands up in the space and be ready for him to do likewise to you. Activate your neck, your shoulder, your body weight as you drive the nut in. And typically fire in twos. <laughs> And then be ready, keep the nut down, be ready to fight off or grapple in, whatever your preference is. But hands in the space, drive the nut in, stay down. <coughs> in multiples. If you're smaller, a bit like the shoulder barge, if you're smaller, you might prefer a rising headbutt, which is when you're lower than the opponent and you drive up off the ground. Again, drive up and in at a diagonal angle under the jaw. <coughs> These work best if you've got some degree of bodily attachment over the shoulder, around the back. <coughs> so drive yourself up, drive yourself up. Once you're done with that, keep the head pressure in and manipulate around or have an exit plan to get yourself out of the game. But if you're smaller, drop your body weight, drive it up, drive it up. Let's get in the nut in. Another great way to use the nut is when you're rolling. Okay, so if I'm a smaller opponent and if he's aggressive and he's throwing bombs, I essentially make sure I bob, weave. As I bob and weave, getting the nut in is actually quite easy. So practice bob, nut, bob, nut. Or, you know, bob, weave, nut, slip, nut. Get used to throwing your tight, close range boxing motions with the headbutt because your head's already moving it's already in train so um, 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 you've already got everything you need to get the nut in so as you're dodging punches and you're moving you're, um, 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 you can get straight on it but again i always advise multiple headbutts most people fluff the first next one groin shot nice and easy two methods for this which i quite like first one it's what I call the gunslinger punch. Imagine you've got a gun in your pocket, you fire it straight up. So if we're doing it bare knuckle, wham, it comes up like this, wham. Okay, like I'm raising a gun in the air. So, we get nice and close to the opponent. Just getting my old timey gloves on. Get nice close to the opponent. If the hand is low, if we've been wedged in low, we essentially use our hips to bump it in as the fist goes, I fire it in from the hip. So my hip fires towards the opponent, like I'm doing a tight roundhouse. So I open up the hip and I fire the punch from the hip into the groin, like so. Typically, I'll get a shoulder attachment as I do it. So I'm gonna hit him a bit high in this so you can see, but as I get close, shoulder attachment here, and I fire the hip in, straight from there. And again, with groin shots, Multiples, double tap it, just to be sure. So often you might miss, you might hit the thigh. You wanna make sure you're doubling your chances. Only costs you a millisecond. And then you can move on to whatever else. So the gunslinger groin shot, it's really good at very close range, making sure your body's behind it. That's why you fire the hip, fire the hip, and you attach to his body up here, so he can't escape. So he's worried about this and not being punched in the groin. Second one is the thumb down. Typically this is up across, so we'll bob low, and we'll shot, fire the shot, thumb down. Tyson's number eight blow, just drop, smash to the groin, thumb down, with the lead or with the rear. But make sure you're getting a decent squat with it. So long range groin shot, squat, thumb down. Thumb down's good, because it raises the shoulder, which means as I go thumb down and hit them in the groin, any shots that come over the top are likely to glance off my shoulder or hit my shoulder instead of my jawbone. So as we're moving, that thumb down raises the shoulder, keeps my head nice and safe. And then finally, in the dirty boxing cannon, we have the good old fashioned chancery. Now chancery is the old fashioned word for holding and hitting. And there are a couple of different types of chancery, but the main for me are this one, chancery number one, so the elbow 
is in the middle of his chest, hand goes around the back, and we belabor from here. Now, a couple of important points. Grabbing the dome of the head and pushing his chin down is useful, but it protects his jaw, okay? I prefer to grab the ear and pull his head to the side. I like to expose a bit of jaw. So I like to reach around a little bit if I can. That is good for compression, but also makes it harder for me to knock him out. If I grab around his ear and twist him a bit, I've got a bit of jaw to play with. So you've got this chancery here. Again, make getting a chancery percussive. So don't just reach and grab. Yeah, it's nasty. You're smashing him around the head. Then turn, then strike. Always make sure after two strikes, you change position, okay? Don't just stand there and keep belaboring because you'll do something about it. So as soon as I've smashed on this chancery, and I've got two blows, I step off to the side. I'm gonna open him up a bit. I'm gonna stretch him out. So I'm gonna push him away a little bit. And then I've got long range artillery. And then I can move again and get him nice and close. Short range artillery. So practice with your chancery. A, explosive entry. Make sure you get him. Secondly, practice double tap and move. Double tap, and move. Double tap and move. That will keep you safe. That will disorientate him. It will keep him off balance. It will disrupt and provide accurate kazushio and balancing, which is what we want from our dirty boxing enough on Bartitsu. So hopefully you found that useful. Those are my top ways of delivering the not so sweet science. So I'll just recap them for you. Rabbit punches, kidney hammers, sneaky elbows, lacing and palming, forearm framing, thumbing, being able to push off at the shoulder, being able to push off with the hand, using the headbutt, using the groin shots, and using chancery and blows. Hopefully you found it useful. Give me a shout if you want any more.